Hello and welcome to UCL Minds' seventh virtual lunch hour lecture. My name is Thomas Gift and I'm a lecturer of political science at UCL. Today we're fortunate to have Dr. Brian Klass who will give us an update on the upcoming 2020 US elections and forecast what he thinks the US political landscape might look like post pandemic. It's really a delight to introduce my friend and colleague, Brian. For those of you who don't know him, uh, Brian is one of those scholars whose resume makes you wonder how he has time to do it all. Uh, he's currently a lecturer in global politics here at UCL, and he writes a weekly column for the Washington Post, where he focuses on US politics and foreign policy. He's also host of a terrific podcast, Power Corrupts, which has received stellar reviews for its in-depth exploration of subjects ranging from fake news and nuclear weapons to ransom and the international arms trade. And if that wasn't enough, Brian is also the author of three books, The Despot's Apprentice, The Despot's Accomplice, and How to Rig an Election. So with that introduction, I'll hand the virtual mic over to Brian and say that we're very much looking forward to the conversation. Uh, we will be taking questions via Sleeto after the talk, information to, to join uh, that conversation you should have already received and will be visible on the screen in front of you. So I hope you enjoy the lecture today and now over to Brian. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you very much, Thomas, for that very kind introduction. Um, we're speaking now at a moment of national crisis in the United States, international crisis, of course, with the pandemic. Um, and a series of interlocking crises in the United States that Donald Trump is dealing with. Um, the three interlocking crises, uh, as you might guess, are the public health issue of the pandemic, the economic fallout associated with it, and the cries for racial justice that are coming out of the Black Lives Matter in the wake of the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And these three events together are posing a existential threat to Donald Trump's presidency as well as causing mass upheaval in the United States. And so we've seen a drastic shift in the contours of the US presidential election in the span of about three months. And we are now about three and a half, four months away from that election on November 3rd. So I'll be previewing what that's going to look like, what the likely outcomes of that will be, what are the X factors that we don't know, because in US politics, there are always many things you don't know. And then beyond that, we'll also be looking forward at what might happen if there was a Joe Biden presidency come January 20th, 2021, or a second Donald Trump term in terms of geopolitics. So with that, I'm gonna switch over to my PowerPoint presentation so I can show you some graphs and charts and make sense of a very strange dynamic in a very strange four years under Donald Trump. So we're gonna start with this, which is the image of Donald Trump coming back from a recent uh, attempted rally in uh, in Oklahoma, an area that has a COVID-19 outbreak uh, currently ongoing and raging. And Trump made this the cornerstone of his relaunch of his re-election campaign. The idea was he was going to go to Oklahoma, pack a stadium, and show people that the flagging poll numbers that he's had are not real, and in fact that he can still fill a stadium. And of course, what happened was something quite different, that about 6,000 people showed up it was uh, not well attended by Trumpian standards. And this image, in a, in a nutshell, sort of encapsulates what's happening to Trump right now, a bit dejected, down in the polls, looking towards November and unsure whether he's going to win. And the reason why that's the case is, as I, sa as I said before, the three interlocking crises uh, that I mentioned. And the first of these, and this is the one that I think is really important to look at, is the current play, state of play with COVID-19 in the United States. So what this graph is showing you is a comparison of the US outbreak put against the European Union outbreak with the total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases per day. And of course, the US yesterday hit a new record, uh, well above 40,000 new cases in a single day. And what you're seeing here is that while the EU and the 440 or so million people in the EU have had steadily falling case numbers, plateauing around 5,000 a day for the last month or so after a major, major surge, the US never really broke the back of the virus early on and only flattened the curve briefly. And now there's a resurgence of virus cases in a very, very damaging way. Um, that resurgence is something that is likely to get much worse. And uh, we will see many more cases in the United States going forward. Now, interestingly, this pandemic is not playing out the same way 
in all parts of the United States. As you might expect, it's a big, diverse country. So if you look here at this chart, what you see in the red line is the U.S. minus New York and New Jersey. And this is the state of the outbreak when you look outside of those two major hotspots. If you look at the blue line, that's New York and New Jersey. So New York and New Jersey, where you saw those stories from April when New York City was totally shut down and was having horrific daily death counts, actually broke the back of the virus. The rest of the United States is quite different. And of course, there is actually a correlation politically here too, because what happened was the early outbreaks were in heavily populated, dense cities, mostly in blue states. And when I say blue states, I mean states that are traditional democratic stronghold states that Hillary Clinton won in 2016. And then later on, as the virus spread throughout the country, it started to touch communities in red states, areas that Donald Trump has a stranglehold on politically and that are more rural, more uh, suburban. And so when you look at this in terms of the political map, this is the, this is the um, COVID cases mapped against whether they're happening in states won by Trump in red or states won by Clinton in blue. And what you're seeing quite clearly is that the outbreak really has narrowed in those blue states and is surging right now in the red states. And that's terrible timing politically. It's terrible news, of course, for the United States because it's a mass outbreak that's going to be very difficult to get under control. But it's also very bad news for Donald Trump politically because what used to be seen by a lot of his supporters as a New York disease or a China disease is now a disease that is taking root in serious fashion in not just battleground states like Florida and Arizona and Texas, which we'll talk about in a second, but also in states that are traditional Republican strongholds. And when you think about presidential elections, they are decided on the margins. They are decided based on swing voters, people who are not diehard Republicans or diehard Democrats, but rather the persuadable middle. And what Trump is, is losing right now is the persuadable middle who looks at these charts, looks at these case spreads, and thinks we're in serious trouble under Donald Trump's leadership, which is very good news for Joe Biden indeed. Now, if you look at one of the reasons why this is happening and why this is so dangerous for Trump politically, is that the pandemic, of course, as we all know, disproportionately affects older people. And the most reliable voters in the United States and indeed in most of the world are people who are 65 plus. These people vote like clockwork. So those are a that's a block of voters that you absolutely need to win or at least do reasonably well with if you want to become president of the United States. And in 2016, Donald Trump won that demographic of 65 plus Americans by 10 points, which added up to millions and millions and millions of votes. What's happening now is Joe Biden, who is also in that 65 plus demographic, as of course is Donald Trump, was already liked pretty well by elderly voters. He had high favorability ratings among 65 plus voters. Then the pandemic struck. And when the pandemic struck, what happened was you had a very, very difficult problem for Donald Trump to solve, which is that on the one hand, there was the pressure to manage the economy. and the other hand, he was trying to make sure that that 65 plus voter base, as well as the 65 plus citizen base, did not either uh, disproportionately feel the effects of COVID or perceive that he was not taking the risks of COVID seriously. And this is where he's in a catch-22. I wrote about this in a Washington Post column about a month ago that I think he has an unsolvable problem on his hands politically. And that problem is that in order to persuade the independents, the people who swing between elections, Democrat to Republican, Republican to Democrat, he needs to convince those people that he's managing the economy really well. But to protect that crucial base of 65 plus voters, he needs to project the image that he doesn't care as much about the economy, but rather cares most about their well-being. And so it's a catch-22. There's no, there's no solution. If, he's, if he is seen to abandon the economy in order to try to prioritize lockdowns that protect public health, that will help him with the 65 plus contingent, but it will hurt him with the independence. And then vice versa, if he were to prioritize reopening, it would help him with the economic independence and would hurt him badly with the 65 plus crowd. And what's happened so far is he's been seen, I think correctly, to have prioritized the economy and the stock market above 
preservation of public health, which is one of the reasons why he's getting quite a lot of criticism at the moment about not wearing masks in public, downplaying the severity of the virus systematically, and saying things, as he did on Fox News last night, like, eventually the virus will just disappear. So those systematic downplaying, the systematic downplaying of the severity of the virus is hurting him politically, and it's very, very difficult to see how he's going to solve that problem absent a vaccine in the coming months. Now, if you look at the approval ratings, and this is, I think, a very interesting point, focus on the bit of the orange, which is the dis disapproval line, and the bit of the green, which is the approval line, when the pandemic strikes. You can see it. He was edging up. It's towards the, 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 far, the, the far right of the graph, right, we're talking about here. He was edging up. The green line was increasing, increasing, increasing. And actually, Trump was looking at like he was at one of the best points politically in his presidency. Then the pandemic, the economy, and the uh, Black Lives Matter protests came as a perfect storm. And his numbers have taken a serious hit. And they are approaching levels that are worse than they've been at any point in his presidency. So you have a moment politically for him where he's heading into re-election at potentially the most unpopular period of his presidency. And he's unpopular in a way that's different from past bouts of unpopularity. So for example, in August of 2017, Donald Trump spoke after the Charlottesville protests, which you may remember involved white supremacists, Ku Klux Klan members, and neo-Nazis marching through a city in Virginia. And he said that those marching with the people with the, the, the white supremacists were, quote, very fine people. And he saw a massive change in his approval ratings, but they bounced back. And the reason they bounced back was because the fundamentals of the economy were still reasonably strong. And a lot of people thought, OK, he said something we don't agree with, but we ex we uh, we approve of the overall state of the country. What's changed recently is that very few Americans of all political stripes believe the country is heading in the right direction currently. So now it magnifies the effects of those uh, statements that are racist or bigoted in any way. It also magnifies the effects of downplaying the severity of the pandemic when in fact, most Americans think it's extremely serious. So these disapproval spikes and the approval drops are likely to stick now in a way that I don't think was the case about prior moments where he lost popularity uh, during his three and a half years in office. Now, if we move on to the next poll or the, the, the next slide, this is to show you the average of national polls between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Now, what's striking about this and what's different about this graph from 2016 is the red and the blue never meet. In other words, Trump has never led Biden in a series of serious polls, right? He has always trailed him by between five and nine points for the most part. You know, there's 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 some polls that are outliers that put them closer, but the the, the broad picture of polling that we're seeing is telling us a very consistent story of Biden beating Trump. Now, in 2016, there are moments like this time in 2016, in the summer of 2016. Uh, where Trump took the lead over Hillary Clinton or was at least statistically tied with her. And that's not happening now. The other thing that's very striking here is that when you look at national polls, as we all know from the 2016 experience in which Trump lost the popular vote to Hillary Clinton, but won the election in the electoral college, the sort of convoluted way that America assigns the, the winner of the presidency by states, what you saw then was a, a reasonably narrow popular vote victory of, of, of uh, I believe it was uh, two and a half percent, roughly. If you have a two and a half percent lead for Joe Biden, it is still plausible that he could lose the election in the Electoral College. If you have, as you have right now, a 9.4 percent average national poll lead for Joe Biden, it is impossible to imagine a scenario under which Biden wins by 10 points and loses the election. It's just too large nationally. But what we're also seeing in the polling is that when you dial into those swing states, the so-called battleground states, where we don't really know who's going to win, the numbers are consistently positive for Biden there as well. So it's not that there's some massive surge of support for Biden in all the wrong places, aka in states he's already going to win, but rather that he is holding consistent and sizable leads in states that Trump needs to win in order to be reelected president. 
So I'll show you a few maps here to make this clear for those of you who are a little bit less attuned to geography in the United States with its politics. What you're seeing here is the actual results from the 2016 election by state. And what you can see is there's a sea of red with a couple bits of blue. Now, the reason of course that is the case is because what's happened in modern American political history is that Republicans do very, very well in rural America, very, very badly in urban America, and the battlegrounds tend to be fought in suburbs. So you're seeing a sea of red in predominantly rural states, many of them small, right? If you look in the middle of the, of the map, at the top, you see North Dakota, South Dakota, extremely rural states, but they only add up to six electoral votes between them. That's the ND and SD you see in the top center of the, of the map. And that's because there's just not that many people who live there. Um, to understand the Electoral College, for those of you who are not familiar with it, <clears throat> the way that it works is there are 538 electoral votes up for grabs, which is why you need 270, a majority, in order to become elected president. The way those numbers break down is you have 100 electoral votes that are allocated based on the Senate. There's 100 senators. Each state has two senators. Therefore, each state automatically gets two electoral votes. Then you also have added to that the 435 members of the House of Representatives, which is a portion based on population. So for example, if you look at Minnesota, where I'm from, that's the blue state in the middle and the top, MN. That state has 10 because there are two senators, as every other state has, plus eight members of the House of Representatives. Eight plus two equals 10, 10 electoral votes. Now, the reason why it's 538 rather than 535, which is what you'd expect from 100 plus 435, is because uh, you still get three electoral votes from Washington, D.C., which you see on the far right of the map in the little block, uh, uh, D.C. 3, right? So that's that's why you get 538 rather than 535. So 270 is the magic number. And as soon as you hit 270 electoral votes, you win. You're the president, right? Um, now, interestingly, almost all of the states record their electoral votes all together, right? So if you see Texas at the bottom center, TX38, you don't split the votes, right? Even if it's a 50-50 contest in the end and Donald Trump wins by one vote, he will get 38 electoral votes. There are a few exceptions to this. You can see this in Maine in the top right uh, of, the, uh, of the, the map where there's uh, apportionment based on congressional districts. But those are the outliers. They're not normal. Most states allocate electoral college votes, winner take all. Whoever gets the most votes in the state gets all the electoral votes. Now, now that we understand that we're all on the same page, I'm going to move to the next slide. What I'm going to toggle between is these two slides. This is the 2016 results. I just showed you this. What you'll see here is... In the top center, there's a band of three states that are red here. WI, right, right next to Minnesota, where I just talked. MI, Michigan. So we got Wisconsin, Michigan. And then if you go right of that, you'll see PA, Pennsylvania. That little arc there is why Donald Trump is president, because those states are typically Democratic states, and they have been for some time. And he managed to flip them. And he managed to flip them with a grand total of roughly 80,000 votes between those three states. So a very, very narrow margin. If all the people who fit in Wembley Stadium switch their votes in those three states, then Hillary Clinton would have been president. It was a narrow margin in a country of 330 million people. So if I switch to the next map, if, he, if Joe Biden, all he does is wins back those states, he will become the president with 278 electoral votes. So that's the most straightforward way for him to become president is just to win back the states that have a tendency to be democratic states anyway. Now, this next map that I'm showing you now, this is the battleground states. These are the ones where we don't know who's going to win. They're generally in play. Some of them more so than others, depending on the polls. But what's really striking if you look at this array of all these states, how many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten 10 states. If I go back to the first map, all of those states that I showed you as battleground states are red. So in other words, the 10 states that most people accept are the battleground states for the 2020 election are all states that Donald Trump won last time around. In other words, there are no states that are currently considered in play that Hillary Clinton won last time. So Joe Biden doesn't need to run the table, and Donald Trump almost needs to run the table with the states he wins. He basically, Donald Trump needs to win most of these 10 states, if not close to all of them, uh, in order to become president. Now, what you'll see here, if you look at the bottom left part of the graph, 
AZ, which is the brown bit there, Arizona. That is trendy and highly democratic. It would be a surprise at this point to me if Joe Biden did not win that state, even though Hillary Clinton lost it in 2016. What you'll note then is there's 11 electoral votes there. So if Biden were to lose Wisconsin again, where you can see the WI in the top center of the graph, that's 10 electoral votes. He could lose Wisconsin, pick up Arizona, you know, grab Michigan and Pennsylvania as is expected, still president. In other words, there's so many different permutations of how Biden can become president and very, very few permutations of how Trump can get reelected. That doesn't mean he's not going to win, right? It's still possible there could be a comeback. So much can change in three months, four months in American politics, as we've seen in the last three or four months. But right now, you would much rather be in Joe Biden's camp than Donald Trump's camp. What's also striking, this last thing I'll talk about with the electoral math, is if you look at Texas and Florida, in the Texas is in the bottom center, TX, Florida in the, in the right bottom, FL, those two states are the easy ways for Biden to win. If he can pick up one of those states, it's over, definitely over. There's no way that Trump becomes president. Um, and Florida right now is currently trending in Biden's direction. He has a lead in the polls that has been consistent of around five points uh, in recent state polling. So that's very bad news for the Trump campaign. Now, if we move to the next aspect of this, one of the reasons why I think we're in such, uh, such problematic territory for Trump is that the one thing that always protected him politically, the one thing that meant that no matter what he did and what he said, he still managed to have between 37 and 45% approval ratings for the last three and a half crazy years of all the things he said and done is because most people have believed that the economy was doing pretty well. And there's a lot of people who vote based on that. They're you know, the pocketbook voters who vote based on how they're like, whether they have a job, whether their stocks are going up, whether their retirement savings are going well, et cetera. Now, if you look at this chart, and this has of course been replicated in the UK and other places as a result of the coronavirus, you see the true scale of the problem, right? These places that are shaded in gray are the years or the months in which the US was in a recession and they are minuscule in terms of new unemployment compared to what we're experiencing right now, where up to 30 million people have lost their jobs in recent months. I mean, it's a huge amount of the American working population. Now, if there are people in the electorate, say those independent swing voters, even the people who voted for Trump last time around, who sort of liked that he was sticking it to the establishment, if they've lost their job, it's harder to pull the trigger voting for someone who they think is amusing or they think is sticking it to the establishment, but they're actually really feeling serious economic pain. And of course, the same is true if your life has been severely disrupted by coronavirus or if you know someone uh, who has either gotten very ill from it or has died, all while Trump has consistently downplayed the severity of the outbreak and uh, held rallies at moments where public health officials said that was deeply irresponsible. So all of these things that are happening at the same time are to say, Normal people in the United States understand we are in crisis, and Trump has not been acting like we are in crisis. In fact, if you look at his Twitter feed um, in the last day or so, he tweeted enormous quantities of tweets yesterday, and almost all of them were about uh, statues, protecting statues of Confederate leaders, about television ratings of Fox, his favorite news channel compared to CNN and MSNBC, and also talking about how he was the victim of fake news. So, you know, th this is one of the problems with how Trump has handled this politically is if he had risen to the occasion of how serious the crisis was, he might have been in better shape politically, but he hasn't. And therefore, he's in very, very difficult circumstances heading into the November election. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, to talk the last five minutes about the international ramifications before we have question and answer. What's changed in the last three and a half years is a dr dramatic change in how much people admire the United States and have confidence in the U.S. leadership, in U.S. leadership to sort of be the global superpower. What you're seeing here on the, on the chart is from Pew Research, and this is a survey of publics, you know, citizenry in uh, various countries about how much confidence they have in Donald Trump to do the right thing regarding world affairs. And the numbers are... I mean, they're, they're the lowest I've seen uh, in, in the polling of, of Pew, and they're totally abysmal, right? I mean, you can see in Germany, 13% of Germans have confidence in Trump. 
Um, you know, in the UK, 32% a bit higher, but still very, very low for what is the UK's most powerful and important ally. Um, you know, similar numbers in most of the uh, major Western alliance countries, you know, whether you go from Italy, Australia, Japan, you know, France, et cetera, very, very poor numbers for Donald Trump. What's important to note here is that this was not always the case. So I went back and looked up Germany, for example, in 2009, when Barack Obama had just become president, that 13 was 93, right? So it's an erosion of 80% confidence among the German public from the beginning of Barack Obama's presidency to the current point of Donald Trump's presidency. Now, a lot of Western leaders internationally, say NATO member countries, understand that it's probably in their country's interest to have a at least a military or economic or you know, some sort of an alliance with the United States being the most powerful country on the planet. But you can only maintain that for so long if your public doesn't agree. And that's, I think, really what's at stake here internationally and geopolitically in the 2020 election is the disconnect between say Angela Merkel saying that we need to be friends with the United States and 13% of Germans having confidence in the United States leader, that's going to boil over to an unsustainable level if Trump is reelected because a lot of people are patient enough to sort of weather the Trumpian storm through three and a half, four years. But if it's becoming the better part of a decade and it's gonna be through 2024, I think you're going to see some pretty drastic geopolitical shifts from Western countries hedging their bets thinking that the United States is not a reliable ally or an admirable ally, as you've seen with some of the stuff with Black Lives Matter. And, and that could have major geopolitical shockwaves. Now, the major beneficiary of those geopolitical shockwaves would, of course, be President Xi of China. And under normal circumstances, and by which I mean normal would be anyone who's not Trump was president, aka any current, you know, sorry, any recent Republican or Democrat had been president, you would have probably had a much more sober response to the coronavirus. You would have had more world leadership. You would have had more spearheading of initiatives uh, at the World Health Organization rather than, for example, withdrawing from the WHO and trying to defund it as Trump did in the middle of the pandemic. And it would have been a, a moment for the US to actually gain relative to China geopolitically because China has some serious vulnerabilities in its narrative, right? And it's, its narrative being that it's a major aspiring world power and yet, it is the source of the coronavirus outbreak. It has responded to it with a series of authoritarian crackdowns. Its human rights picture is, of course, quite bleak. And as a result, it would, have, it would have been a moment of opportunity for the U.S. to sort of hurt that global leader image that China is seeking to project. Instead, there has been a major opening for China internationally as a result of Trump unilaterally withdrawing from global leadership, not just with the coronavirus, but of course, with withdrawing from the Paris Climate Accords and all of the other things that he's done that have shown that he is not interested in the US being uh, a major world superpower in the way that it has been historically. So what I suspect the 2020 pivot point will be is if Biden wins, one of his top line arguments in his campaign has been to make the US respected again internationally, and that comes with re-engaging with the world, including you know, quickly uh, reinstating the Paris Climate Accords, coming back to the WHO, a series of international agreements, et cetera, and trying to swing that momentum back towards the US. Now, that, whether that's going to work or not is a question. But I think if Trump is reelected, we will see a seismic shift in geopolitics where even staunch US allies start to hedge their bets. They start to diversify their alliances. They start to downgrade the number of eggs they put in the US alliance basket and so on. So that's, I think, what's really at stake here internationally. I've explained to you why I think Biden is likely to win. Of course, never say never in US politics. Many, many pundits learned that lesson the hard way in 2016. But right now, it is looking like if current trends hold, uh, Joe Biden will likely defeat Donald Trump in November. We will have an extremely interesting, to put it charitably, period between November 3rd and January 20th, when the new president is inaugurated. And we will, we will potentially return to some level of normalcy uh, into 2021. But as I say, the they're serious, and there are so many unknowns that we simply can't uh, say with certainty exactly what will happen. And with that, I will turn things back over to Thomas, who will lead you in uh, a bit of question and answer for me. 
Thanks, Brian. That was a very insightful lecture. And as Brian said, we're going to transition now to the Q&A portion of this event. And I'd encourage you to submit all of your questions on Sleeto, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. As we wait for questions to come in, I'll just by, start by asking you this, Brian. Is the, is the 2020 election primarily a referendum on the president? And if so, should Biden's strategy simply be to lie low and play not to lose and hope Trump's approval ratings uh, remain in the basement? Or does he still have to run an assertive or even bold campaign where he's playing to win? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very good question. So I think what you've seen in the last couple months, the, the main criticism of Biden in the last couple months has been that he hasn't been as outspoken, as visible. He's been, of course, you know, the, the Republican attack on him is that he's been in his basement where he's been isolating because of the pandemic. That period has also been the period where his lead over Trump has drastically expanded. And that leads me to conclude that this is a referendum on Trump, because I don't think that what's happened in the last three months has been that people have gotten to know Joe Biden in a different way than they did before. I think what people have started to think in the last three months is things are extremely serious in these three crises. We don't have a leader who is rising to the challenge. And we have a steady pair of hands in Joe Biden because he was president for eight years previously. He knows what he's doing and he's not going to mess things up in a serious way. The, the, the sort of idea that he's competent is one that I think is probably his strongest suit. Now, that being said, you know, when it comes to the, who actually shows up on November 3rd, that's very important. And if Biden doesn't do outreach to the sort of Bernie Sanders wing of the, of the party, the Democratic Party, which views Biden as too moderate, that could be a problem for him. I mean, there's no question about that. But I do think that in terms of raw numbers of voters, what Trump should really worry about and what Biden should really focus on uh, solidifying is the swings of two blocks. One is the older voters I talked about previously, right, where, where Biden has made eight major inroads in a very, very important demographic. And the other is in white, non-college educated voters that are that are Trump's base. That is literally the most common group of Trump voters, the white, uh, non-college educated males. Now, Biden is going to get absolutely stomped in that demographic, but he's going to get stomped less than Hillary Clinton got stomped in that demographic, right? He lost, Hillary Clinton lost that demographic by above 30 points. If Biden loses it by 10 points, he'll probably be president. So I think that that's, that's something to keep in mind is you have a lot of discourse within the Democratic Party about winning over the Bernie Sanders contingent, et cetera. Um, but there's a much larger block of voters that is stop the bleeding among demographic uh, groups that Trump won big in 2016. If he doesn't win them big this time around, that's actually more of a problem for Trump. So, so, to, so to answer your question in a nutshell, I'd say this will be a referendum on Trump. Doesn't mean Biden should not run a bold campaign. He should, absolutely should. Um, but I think ultimately, this is going to be a lot of people going to the polls and saying, do we want four more years of this or not? And I, I think it's really that simple for most voters. Great. Uh, another question that just came in is you mentioned the older vote is a very reliable voting block. Uh, what about younger voters who are also vitally important? What, what do you think that demographic is going to do in this election and how might it tip the scale one way or the other? Yeah, I mean, this is something, this is a, a question that I often get from students. And, and what I try to impress on students is that there is a chicken or egg problem with young voters, which is many young voters are understandably disillusioned with the system that has too often forgotten younger voters. The reason why that happens is because younger voters vote in very small numbers proportionately compared to older voters. And so campaigns do something that is highly rational, problematic, right? I'm not endorsing it, but they do something that's highly rational. They focus their resources on the groups that are most likely to vote. And that unfortunately has not been the 18 to 24 demographic in, in, in most recent elections. So, this time around, I think there is some reason to wonder whether those trends will be different. Um, you know, there is reason to question and raise the possibility that younger voters who are energized by issues like climate change or, issue, or just, you know, energized by issues like Black Lives Matter, which is resonating enormously with, with younger voters, are going to turn out in, in, in numbers that are, is, is not expected, right? And, that, and that's something that is so again, it's a data point that if that happened would be very, very bad for Donald Trump because that group um, overwhelmingly votes, would vote for Joe Biden. Um, that being said, it's, you know, as I say, it's, it's a total X factor. Um, we don't have good polling data on that because what you do in polls is you ask questions like, are you likely to vote in 2020? If you say yes, you're included in the data. 
If you say no, you're effectively weeded out of the data. So all we have is self-reporting measures. But if, if the young people are not being reached by the polls or they're not saying, they're not participating in polls, which sometimes is a problem, right? Young people just hang up when the phone is, is ringing. So this, this is an issue that, you know, we don't really have a good answer to. But I, but I do suspect that we will see a spike, albeit possibly a modest spike, in younger voters and in uh, African-American voter turnout. And both of those would be good news for Joe Biden. Okay, uh, next question. Do you think Trump's legacy will tarnish the Republican Party in future elections going forward, especially in some of the key battleground states that you were talking about earlier in your talk? Yes, I do. And I, I, but I think that the answer to that question is going to be completely contingent on what happens on November 3rd in terms of margins. So I, I wrote a recent column about this as well in terms of what happens depending on whether Trump loses by one point, one percent, or he loses by 15 points, 15 percent. If Trump loses by one point, I think what Republicans will do is they'll think what has happened is that Trump found a winning message. He just didn't have the discipline to execute it. In other words, if he nearly wins by you know, a very, very narrow loss, then they'll say, okay, if, he, if, we, if we just ran Trump 2.0, somebody who tweeted a bit less, wasn't as overt in his racism, wasn't as into name calling, all these sort of things that, that on a personal level voters don't like, uh, with the exception of, of Trump's base, then he would have won, right? Or she would have won. And so in that narrow election defeat uh, scenario, you have, I think, a Republican Party that stays Trumpist, for lack of a better word, for a considerable period of time. And I think the 2024 nominee, if it's not Trump again, if he tries to run again, because he would be allowed to, um, would be somebody who's very Trump-like. If Trump loses by 15 points, I think that that will change what the Republican Party does, because I think what they will say is that we were historically wiped out, right? This, if it's a 15 point defeat for Trump, um, the Senate will go to the Democrats, the Democrats will run the table in the House, it will be a wipeout of the Republican Party on a national scale, and they will be forced by simple electoral math to change. Um, the X factor here, and this is the, the, the wrinkle in all this, if you look at the, the number of people in the House of Representatives in 2016 who were Republicans, and you look at them after 2020 based on people who have lost elections, retired, left, been primaried, in other words, challenged by the Republicans and lost, about half of the people who were the Republican House members in 2016 are not going to be in the Republican House in 2021. And the people who have replaced them love Trump. So this is the sort of wrinkle is that even if Trump is wiped out, a lot of the sort of elected officials in the Republican Party in Congress like Trump. So it may well be that um, the Republican Party has a long process of evolving away from Trumpism, even if he is defeated in historic terms. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, another question that just came in is if just 80,000 people out of nearly 330 million citizens in the United States can decide the presidential election, do you think it's time for ele electoral reform? Yes, I do. Um, I, I think there's a series of reasons why that would be beneficial. It would require a constitutional amendment or there's a convoluted way of doing this called the interstate, uh, I think it's called the Interstate Electoral College Pact or something like that. It's, I don't remember the exact name. But um, how you get there is, is, a, is a procedural point. The merits of, of doing away with the Electoral College I think are substantial. And the reason why I think so is if you look, if you map out the campaign visits in the last, say, six elections, six presidential elections, they're concentrated overwhelmingly. I think it's like 95% have happened in six states. And they're not even the six largest states, right? There's six states that just happen to be divided pretty equally between Republicans and Democrats. And what that means is you get a massive distortion in how campaigns are run. They're run to persuade people in a very small number of states. You get these types of distortions, by the way, in the way that the primary system, which selects nominees for president, occur as well. So, for example, Iowa and New Hampshire are consistently the first two states to determine who the uh, nominee for the Democratic and Republican parties are. And because Iowa and New Hampshire are 90 plus percent white, because they're overwhelmingly rural states, you have the presidential campaigns launched and catering to a group of people that simply does not look like America. And that is, of course, the case in battleground states, too. Um, a lot of the battleground states in this election are whiter than the national average. They have different concerns than the national average. 
And fundamentally, I think it's tough for the United States to sort of be a beacon of democracy when we've had multiple elections in which millions more people have picked someone who ultimately did not become the president. It's the only national office, or sorry, it's the only federal office in which you can win with having fewer votes. Um, and, and I think, you know, at some point it's just unsustainable. I also think the, the reason why I've come around to this point of view is because the demographic trends are skewing that even more. In other words, you're having more and more emphasis of small rural states having disproportionate elect electoral clout to uh, larger, larger urban states with diverse populations. And I think if the U.S. wants to address some of its longstanding issues on some of those questions, it's going to need a different way of electing presidents. Okay, great. Uh, another question. Uh, how do you think that the dramatic uh, Trump narrative of the last few years has impacted the legacy of Obama, other than simple reversals of certain policies? Well, I think, you know, I've thought a lot about this question. It's an, it's an excellent question. Um, I'll give you the sort of uh, more broad answer first and then the more technical one. The, the broad answer is, I think that when history is written about the Trump era, I think what people will say is, Barack Obama, you know, is known to history as the first black president, along with all the other series of things, you know, healthcare that he accomplished in his, in his presidency. And that Donald Trump was the backlash to the first black president. And that Donald Trump was, in a way, you know, my, my hope would be um, that he is viewed as the sort of um, last gasp of a country in which it's acceptable and actually strategic to play up uh, white nationalism and racist, you know, bigotry. And, and so I think that that is one way that, that Obama will be viewed is that there's this foil of two presidents, right? The, the one that represents progress in, in America's racial divide and its longstanding, um, you know, injustices for ethnic minorities communities, and that there was not a, a country that was willing to go quietly in, in hanging on to some of those prejudices. So I think that's that's one way that I think history will view this period. Um, in terms of the actual legacy of, of Obama, I think you know I think one of the things that's happening is stuff that Obama got through and that Trump has undone is unpopular that Trump undid it. In other words, there's very high support for Barack Obama's signature healthcare policy, very high support for reinstating the Paris Climate Accords. So I suspect that if Trump wins another term. Um, you know, the unpopular stuff will be solidified and could undo Obama's legacy in a big way. If if Trump loses, I think Biden will reinstate quite a lot of the Obama legacy in policy terms very, very quickly, and uh, it will survive and become permanent. And in fact, I think things like the health care legislation that Obama uh, championed, the so-called Obamacare, will probably be expanded considerably under a Biden presidency, making it even more of a milestone achievement. Okay, great. Uh, another question. Do you think that Trump has left a permanent vacuum in international leadership or will Biden be able to recover uh, U.S. leadership and its reputation fully if he wins? I mean, this is the, what, 16, 20 trillion dollar, whatever the U.S. GDP question. I mean, it's, it's a huge question that so much hinges on. Um, and I just don't know. Um, I, I like to think that there is the possibility of repairing the damage. And the optimistic side of me believes that if Obama, sorry, if Trump is repudiated at the polls in a significant way, that the narrative that will take root in our allies' capitals, who have been, you know, I think alarmed is putting it lightly in the last three and a half years. Um, I think that the narrative that will take root there is that this was a mistake and an aberration that the American public realized and that they've slapped, they've sort of snapped back to, uh, you know, being sensible with, with international affairs, and therefore, let's just forget it and move on. Um, that, that's the optimistic side of me. I, do, I, I think I, I genuinely am quite pessimistic if Trump wins a uh, re-election that there will be a unfixable problem in U.S. international leadership. I don't, I don't think that the U.S. will be able to recover its sort of position as global superpower uh, by 2024 if Trump were to re be re-elected. But there's also, you know, there's been longstanding shifts. I mean, one thing that I think we're all prone to do, this is political scientists, pundits, et cetera, is to blame everything on Trumpism. U.S. power has been declining for some time, right? I mean, if we really want to trace the decline, I think it's really back to the sort of Iraq war, the financial collapse. The U.S. has had a receding influence on global affairs for the better part of the last two decades. So it may be that Trump accelerated that and that Biden's attempt at reversing 
is sort of like, you know, trying to plug holes in a very badly damaged dam in which the water is already leaking out. So, you know, we'll have to see it. Biden will make it a centerpiece of his uh, presidency. And the reason I'm confident he'll do so is because he was in charge of the Senate Foreign Foreign Relations and Foreign Affairs Committee for, for quite some time. And he understands how important diplomatic achievements are to U.S. national interest and to domestic achievements. So uh, I think he'll make it a center point of his presidency if he wins, but whether the world is forgiving, uh, I don't know. Okay, great. Uh, Another question here, and this is something that's probably going to come up in the news in the next few weeks, is what difference will Biden's choice of vice president make? And I guess I'll add to that. Do you have any predictions about who he might choose or who you think he should choose? It's a good, very good question. Um, okay, so Biden has said that he will pick a woman to be his vice president, uh, which will be the first time that potentially a woman vice president actually wins. We've had there was a female vice president on the ticket in 1984, but but that ticket lost. Um, so it could be historic in that regard. Um, there is a lot of speculation, and I think this is what the campaign is saying. It's what you know the, the sort of consensus view is right now is that there's a short list of a few names. Um, and that four of the five that I've heard are African-American women. Um, the, the most obvious pick would be Kamala Harris, the senator, Democratic senator from California. Um, but Elizabeth Warren would be the other vice presidential pick that a lot of people have heard of. Um, there are other picks like Val Demings, um, a former police chief, uh, African-American police chief in Florida. Uh, so I, I don't know is the, is the short answer. In terms of how much it affects uh, turnout and the results, I think it could do significant good in um, for the Biden campaign, significant, have a significant effect in terms of solidifying the Democratic base. So this could be a surrogate that really fires up the people who are less sure about Joe Biden in the first place. I don't think there's that many people, though, in, in the United States who are going into an election where they decide, do we want four more years of Trump? And they're going to be swayed by the vice presidential pick of the Democratic challenger, right? And because of what I said about how this is a referendum on Trump and whether we want four more years of this or not, I just don't see that many people saying, yep, he got the vice president pick right. Now I will vote for Joe Biden. Or mm, I'm not crazy about the vice presidential pick for Joe Biden. Now I want Trump for four more years. It just seems like that's unlikely. What it could do, as I say, is, is turn out for energizing the Democratic base and really firing up blocks of voters. Um, and of course, you know, there's a question about if you were to pick an African American vice president, uh, female vice president, whether that would really, you know, fire up the people who care a lot about the Black Lives Matter protests right now. Uh, having an African American side by side sharing power with Joe Biden in the White House could be a signal to those younger voters, for example, we talked about that Biden is, has heard them and is taking them seriously. So it's more about consolidating voters that he has or that like him to begin with, than it is about winning over new voters that don't like Joe Biden already. Great. Uh, One of our audience members asks, uh, how nasty is the campaign likely to get, especially if Biden maintains uh, these poll gaps? And what types of tactics do you think that Donald Trump uh, will pursue, especially if he's feeling uh, desperate going into the elections? I mean, this is going to be the ugliest scorched earth campaign I think we've ever seen. It, it already is. I mean, the, this, the thing that's happening is there's a campaign occurring on social media that Trump is running that is extraordinarily ugly. I mean, conspiracy theories, unhinged accusations, really dangerous rhetoric, I would argue. Um, stuff that invokes political violence. All that stuff is, is happening. It's just not necessarily in international news for the depressing reason that it's become normal, which is to say that we've just gotten used to it. So now we no longer report on latest the, the latest Trump ad and how incredibly violent the rhetoric is or incredibly bigoted the, the, the imagery is, whatever it is. Um, I'll, I'll respond also by saying I'm extremely worried about what's going to happen between November 3rd and January 20th if Trump loses. I'm worried what will happen before then, because I think things like voter suppression will be part of the Trump playbook if he's down in the polls, right? Trying to make sure that people who want to vote can't vote. And of course, there's a racial bias to this. We already have a problem with this in the United States where uh, African-Americans, I believe, have about 45% longer waiting times than white voters. Latino voters, about 46% longer waiting times than, than white voters on average. So that attempt, I think, especially in the moment of the pandemic, where there's already going to be pretext by which you can close polling locations. I'm really worried about that. Um, After the election, if Trump loses, there is this period in US politics between November 3rd and January 20th, the inauguration, 
where Trump is still in office, but he will have known the, the result. And it's quite clear he's going to try to discredit the results. Um, he tried to do this in 2016 when he won, right? When he won the election, he claimed that three to five million people voted illegally, which is totally, it's a lie. I mean, it's totally untrue. There's no evidence to back it up whatsoever. And he tried to discredit that election, even though he won. So the idea that he would try to discredit an election he loses, I do not find far-fetched, right? And he's already been tweeting about this consistently. Now, again, this is where the margins come into play, because if it's a narrow election, that's a very destabilizing thing for the president to do. If it's a landslide election, it will be him screaming into the Twitter wind saying, I was robbed, when in fact, you know, normal people will see the resounding defeat and think, look, even if there were minor, minor irregularities, which there may be, um, they wouldn't have affected the result. So anyway, I, I think I'm optimistic uh, in terms of the resilience of American democracy to put who has won the election in the White House. I'm very pessimistic about how ugly it's going to be to get there. Okay. Great. Uh, one person asks, uh, do you think Joe Biden has more international support? And I guess I'll just reframe that a, a little bit to ask, what do you think the US-UK alliance would look like under Biden in contrast to what it's been under Trump for the last three and a half years? Good question. Um, so I think internationally, there's a clear favorite for most countries with, the, with two big exceptions. So uh, I think Russia and China are very keen on seeing Donald Trump reelected. Um, you know, we saw there was interference on Trump's behalf, uh, information warfare launched by the Kremlin, etc. I have no reason to believe that won't happen again, or is already happening, which is what the intelligence consensus seems to be. Um, they want him not because he's necessarily going to be better for their issues, although for Russia, he probably will be, but more because a, a splintered, chaotic Western alliance is the best thing for Putin and Xi. Um, you know, Biden, I think, is the clear favorite for most NATO member countries because he values the alliance quite clearly. He doesn't berate them publicly, et cetera. In the UK-US relationship, one of the things that's interesting is Trump has spoken a big game, right? I mean, you, Thomas, know you've been, you've been, I'm sure, interviewed many times about the UK-US trade deal, for example, which the BBC often covers. And what Trump has done for the last three and a half years is said, we're going to fast track it. It'll be top of my list. I'll sign it immediately, right? Well, I mean, each successive month, it hasn't happened. And now the time has run out. There's no way there'll be a trade deal, a serious trade deal, before the election. So, you know, I, I think that the idea that Trump is going to do some sort of benevolent trade deal for the United Kingdom is a fantasy. He's a, he's a transactional person. The only way that he will sign a deal is if he can publicly claim victory, which to him means the other side loses. Whereas Biden would approach it as, uh, you know, the standard internationalist approach, which I think George W. Bush or Barack Obama or Bill Clinton would have done, which is to say, we all win when there's a good trade deal. And, and, I, and I think that's a problem for the British government because the British government needs to claim that Brexit, Brexit has created victories and that global Britain is really doing great trade deals. If Trump comes out and says, I rolled, the, you know, I totally rolled over Boris Johnson and got everything I want and he got nothing, that's a political problem for the UK. So I uh, I still think the transatlantic alliance will be close, but as I said before, you know, if Trump wins re-election, it's harder to sell the British public on a close alliance with a country that most people do not have confidence in. Okay, uh, terrific. I think we have time for one more question, and I'll ask one uh, that someone uh, said here that's a little bit more personal, and that is, are there any readings you would recommend to accompany your lecture? And I guess that's accepting uh, your own three books that, or perhaps the one that you're currently writing. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, the one, the one I, I am plugging my own book here, but the one that's, I think, the most relevant book that I've written about this is called The Despot's Apprentice, and it's all about Trump's authoritarian streak. And I think that's uh, also something I could have talked about for quite a long time today, because I am worried about American democracy going forward. Um, other than that, I think, you know, the, the main thing is to all this, I'm not going to recommend any books. And the reason is that they become outdated in Trumpism uh, very, very quickly, which is to say that so much has changed in the last few months that you read something that's scholarship from, you know, 2017 and, and the world has moved on. What I would say is that, you know, there's a lot of very good data analysis that goes on around trying to figure out who's going to win the election at places like 538, which is Nate Silver's website, the New York Times and the Upshot blog. Um, the Atlantic has incredibly good long form journalism. Uh, going on right now about major issues like race in the United States, 
uh, like issues around the pandemic. So, you know, if you're interested in U.S. politics, I think the things to do are to read the Washington Post. Of course, I'm plugging in. You know, I write for them every week. But uh, the Washington Post and the New York Times are the two dailies that I read every day. And then uh, for longer form stuff, the New Yorker and the Atlantic. Um, Vox is a more wonky version of it, but I think quite good. Uh, and then 538 for data journalism and data analysis around polls. So that's the sort of panoply of, of, of the sources that I go through. And um, if you want to stay informed as we go through the topsy-turvy world that is going to be the next several months, um, that's what I do to keep up to speed. Okay, terrific. So I think that is all the time that we have. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Brian, uh, so much for your time. It was a really fascinating lecture uh, and some great insights here. Obviously, everyone's going to be thinking about the 2020 election uh, here over the next uh, few months. And I think you gave us a lot, a lot to think about. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank everyone in the audience uh, joining us uh, today. You will receive an email in the next day or so with a short feedback survey uh, and also the upcoming schedule uh, of lectures and we do hope to see uh, you soon at an, another lecture going forward so in the meantime stay well and thanks so much for your time